The UK has slammed Moscow for giving a death sentence to two British fighters captured while fighting for Ukraine. A Moroccan national has also been sentenced. While well, the three fighters were tried in what has been described as a proxy court in Russian-occupied eastern Ukraine on Thursday. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss says that the judgment is a sham and says that she's working with her Ukrainian counterpart to secure their release. Well, the UK's Defence Secretary has also arrived in Kyiv for talks with the country's president. However, the Kremlin's Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova says that Donetsk People's Republic and not Russia is responsible for the conviction while labelling Number 10's reaction as hysterical. Well, let's cross to Kiev now. We can bring in Wayne Jordash, who is the managing partner of Global Rights Compliance Law Firm. Wayne, thanks for being back with us on the programme. What is the latest that you know about the status of these men? Well, the situation remains as is, which is that after a trial which lasted a shockingly uh, less than three days, uh, the men have been sentenced to death, despite the fact that they're clearly part of the Ukrainian army, clearly not mercenaries and clearly were found or surrendered in Mariupol, where, where they'd been defending against Russia's aggression. So uh, Liz Truss, the, uh, the foreign ministry of, uh, minister of the UK's assessment as, of the trial as sham is, 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 is correct, it's accurate, and that's where we are. Talk to us a little bit more about the legality, the fact that this isn't been a internationally recognised conviction. Um, it's a violation of the Geneva Convention. Tell us more about that. Well, Geneva Convention 3 uh, essentially uh, means that if they're part of the Ukrainian armed forces, which is what they were, whether they're volunteers or actually um, recruited members of the Ukrainian armed forces, then they are prisoners of war. And as such, they have combat immunity. That means they can't be prosecuted for participating in the conflict and participating by defending, let's say, in Mariupol. Uh, they uh, are entitled uh, to fight to defend the, for the Ukrainians. Now, what the Russians say is, well, they were mercenaries. But if that's correct, then they have to prove uh, that the men were not part of the Ukrainian army, that they were not resident in Ukraine, and that they were receiving funds which are in excess of what the Ukrainian army uh, recruits and uh, military uh, are receiving, and not, none of that um, is, is, has been demonstrated, and none of it can be demonstrated. It just beggars belief, to be honest. So it's unlawful to put them on trial, and if, let's say, they were put on trial for violating uh, IHL, that is, uh, committing war crimes, then the trial has to be fair. Willfully denying them a fair trial is a war crime in itself, and there's no doubt that Russia is responsible for that. Well, there are many theories as to Russia's actions and aims in all of this, um, whether, for example, President Putin could be trying to extract something from the UK, concessions in this, whether he could be using it for a potential prisoner swap. What do you think? I think that's crystal clear. I think um, uh, Putin understands that he cannot win this war fairly through military means. That's been demonstrated by the Ukrainians time and time again. If they have weapons, they can defeat the Russians. That seems clear. So Putin falls back on his usual playbook, which is to coerce, to blackmail, uh, to use uh, dishonest means to achieve his political aims. And so uh, British hostages are an important part of that. He can use them to negotiate for the release of his prisoners or for other geopolitical aims. It is so, Putin's way. So, Wayne, if these men are being used and held as hostages then, where does that leave them in their fates? And in terms of the UK and trying to secure their release, um, what wiggle room, what possibility is there to see these men free? Well, there's no wiggle room in terms of using the law, that's for sure, because this is a regime that ignores international law. Um, but there is wiggle room, I would say, um, if the West, including the UK, but particularly the UK, applies pressure and makes it very clear to Russia uh, that if these men are executed, uh, that Russia, Putin and his uh, entourage will pay consequences for that, whether legally or whether diplomatically whether sanctions-wise and so on. 
that's the only uh, room there is now for wriggle. All right, Wayne Jordish, managing partner of global rights compliance law firm in Kiev. Good to talk to you, Wayne. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, Ukraine's authorities are warning that the war-ravaged port city of Mariupol is on the brink of a cholera breakout. Kyiv says mass graves are contaminating the city's limited water supply and that could prompt the spread of the deadly bacterial disease. Well, there are fears that up to 10,000 of the city's residents could die from infectious diseases by the end of the year. Well, President Zelensky has called once again for more support from Europe to help his country fend off Russia's aggression. Making an address at Copenhagen's Democracy Summit, he called on Brussels to not hesitate in cutting off relations with Moscow and urged for its support in the nation's bid for candidacy. We must finally remove this grey zone, which is so tempting to the Russian state. We must move to actions from words that Ukraine is part of the European family. In the coming weeks, the European Union can make a historical step, which will prove that the words about Ukrainian people belonging to the European family are not empty. Well, as you can imagine, it's a huge talking point here in Brussels as the clock ticks down to that EU summit on the 23rd and 24th of June, which will address this very issue of Ukraine, Ukrainian candidacy and also Moldovan and Georgia. We saw just yesterday the president of Georgia, Salome Zurbishvili, in town showing her face, reminding this town and the EU institutions that her country also wants to join the European Union. And just this weekend, Ukrainians based here in Brussels will be planning to do a human change right around all the EU institutions to make sure their voice is heard at that EU summit. Now, we did hear a little bit earlier today in Copenhagen Hagen from the European Parliament President, that's Roberta Metzola, and she firmly said that Ukraine belonged in the European family and that the European Parliament would be supporting that bid. But it's not up, of course, to the European Parliament or the European Parliament President. It will be up to the European Council, the heads of state when they meet in the building here behind me. And of course, they'll be understanding the sensitivities around enlargement. We've got countries like Serbia and North Macedonia, a country lining up to join North Macedonia even changed its name in order to be able to get into the European Union. But negotiations still have not started. Now, I had the chance to speak to Charles Michel, the president of the European Council, and I asked him if he was a little bit concerned that he was over-promising to countries like Ukraine that they would be able to be fast-tracked into the European Union, that he wasn't afraid he'd be under-delivering. Delivering. Take a listen. Very important to be to be uh, to be frank, to be to be sincere, and this is the, the reason for our full support for Ukraine. Uh, and we know this is extremely difficult because uh, people of Ukraine they are resisting, they are suffering a lot, and they are fighting for their homeland, for the future of their children. They are also fighting for our common principles and our common uh, values. And uh, day to day within the European Council, we discuss and we decide how we can improve our level of support for Ukraine. So a very vague answer there from the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, because deep down he knows just how difficult it is to join the European Union and just how sensitive and complex these upcoming discussions will be when the opinion of the European Commission is on the table at that EU summit on the 23rd and 24th of June.